hello and thank you for coming. Uh, this is our 10th and final Unseen piecemeal, um, which is so exciting that we've done 10, but also sad that it's our last one. Um, for those of you who don't know what Unseen is, it is a project um, that we have developed at Shieldfield Artworks that looks at um, what the difference is between audio and visual and how we've experienced artwork throughout um, lockdown, not being able to go to exhibitions or, or gallery spaces um, and see works physically. And so we have 10 artists who we've asked to be involved. And the first artist was given an audio recording that we had created at Saw, and they had to make a visual piece from that. They had two weeks to do that. And then from their visual piece, they also created their own audio describing what they'd made. And that was passed on to the next artist. Um, the next artist hadn't seen the visuals, so they just had to work from that audio recording. And it was passed on like a, a relay race um, until the 10th artist. Um, and so today we have Lucy Heaton, who is our, our final artist, Lucy's raving. Um, no. So I was wondering, Lucy, if you could just tell us a little bit about um, who you are, what you do and your practice and yeah. Hi, I'm Lucy. Um, yeah, I'm an artist. I'm studying at Newcastle at the moment. So I'm about to go into my final year. Um, and yeah, I like to make videos and performances. Um, usually they're quite layered and I'm really interested in games and play and play theory and also words and movement. I'm interested in lots of things, um, but yeah. Yeah, so it's that's me. Great, thank you. Um, so we're going to see Lucy's work. It was slightly different this week. I'm going to put a link into the chat um, because Lucy has made a video work. And um, if you then put yourself on mute and follow the link, it will take you to YouTube. Um, and it's a minute and a half. Um, I, th I think we're gonna do it this way this time because it's less jumpy than usual. If we usually, when we show it on the on the computer, it jumps a little. Um, is that okay with everyone or, or is that a problem for anyone? Okay, great. Front end up, front top down, up, bend back down, up, up. No, that's not the time. Aerial flip, I'm sure it's ten to six. Two hours wrong. Stop speeding around and wrong round and over and after. It's not afternoon yet. I'll lilt her till six if I want to. Lilt her, tilt her, lilt her, tilt her. You can't just scoop up the afternoon in your arms like that. Scoop up, turn I can and I will break down the windowsill. Go and pace faster than cock pace. What a time. What, what a time to be stuck pending and upended. <sighs> I'm just trying to turn over. To turn. You've got a quarter squirm, sideward six, tip topple your weight. Rotate that outline limb like a time telling spoke. Limb as lever to leave here. On side, brush off, pet lean, thin up. Cool, I'm off the face of this clock. Bye, bye, bye. Um, thanks for that, Lucy. Um, I hope everyone thanks. enjoyed that. Um, I was wondering, just to start us off, if you can just tell us a little bit about your thoughts behind the piece and how you got to wear where it is um i suppose i i think from the audio that i got um there was a particular phrase which or word that i didn't know the meaning of and i like looked up and it was echolalia um which means uh repeating what someone says automatically like in a conversation and so i was started thinking a lot about like mimicking things and repetition and um what that could mean and then i was thinking so i had this this clip from age from a while ago like a few months ago that I so I knew that I wanted to make something with but I didn't really know what so I decided to use that as kind of a starting point for the visuals of it um because and but then use the ideas from the audio that, and um kind of then try to mimic this ladybird spinning um and see what that would do yeah <laughs> and yeah I suppose that's what I did <laughs> and then think about time and um 
repetition and different other things that re the, the ladybird moving reminded me of and yeah like to just go from there mm. and in your audio that you'd sent us um i realize no one else has heard it but you talked about repetition um this idea of repetition being insistence can you talk a little bit about that and what that means yeah so um it was this phrase that I did, I heard this artist told me in a workshop a while ago, um, which is like stuck in my head. I always think back to it when I'm making, which is repetition is insistence. And I, I suppose I was also thinking about um, in terms of repetition in, when I was making this is when something is automatically re repeated or when something is on per very purposefully repeated. And so like when repetition is insistence, it's like I've got so much of something that it must mean something or I'm doing something so many times that it's like kind of hammering home um, what it is that I'm trying, trying to say, or even if it's not very clear what it is, it's the repetition of it kind of just emphasizes it. And then also, but then on the flip side of that, in terms of what is an, what is it? What does it mean when you repeat yourself automatically or like when so if you're in a room and um someone else is yawning and then you start yawning or um like you respond to like a social cue and then you kind of just mimic a, like how someone else is moving kind of and you didn't realize you were doing that and stuff like that <laughs> um yeah i was also thinking quite a lot about um repetition in terms of um this this idea of mimicry because I've been reading about play theory and um, this this man Roger Calwa I think he's French basically he says there's four different types of play one of them is like to do with like disorientation and like vertigo and like stuff like tightrope walking and then like another one he talks about is mimicry and like disguise and um, yeah and and this thing of like imitating something and like he applies that to like to both um, say if you're watching a sport and you lean towards that that kind of is mimicking it but then also like putting like dressing up as someone is also included in that thing that he's talking about but yeah I guess you have that in in childhood games as well as like Simon says or just the way that children yeah. to mimic what the people they're around and, and copy what they're doing mm. I think it's definitely, I was also thinking about it as a way of learning. Um, so at the moment I'm trying to learn some Italian because I'm going on Erasmus and I need to speak Italian for it. But like I do these, like um, I, I listen to someone say something and then I repeat it. And then I'm actually, I'm not sure if I'm actually thinking or if I'm just like regurgitating what they say. And then also kind of, I remember when I was like revising for exams, I would, um, say aloud what the, the thing I was trying to learn so many times until it became like not the thing I was trying to learn but like that as a process I feel like that's quite like tied up with my making as well I think a lot about like loops um, and like voc like vocal loops and words that repeat and or like in saying like Simon says like where there's kind of like a call and response almost where between the body and and um, yeah something more vocal. Mm. I think in your application you talked about this project being a verbal relay race or something. And yeah. We shamelessly stole that frame. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, so the different footage, can you talk us through how you decided to do that um, different elements and, and how why you collaged them together? That yeah. Um so I kind of first of all I was thinking, I was actually um a bit ambitiously just thought that the best thing I could do was to learn to break dance um, like the ladybird but then I realized that that's like not possible in two weeks um, so I didn't do that but I did like look at quite a lot of videos of people um, like spinning on their back and stuff and then I um, was gonna try and make some sort of like structure for me to to like work within as a way of like copying it but um, so like a shell, but then I, and then I walked in the park and I saw that those kind of like playground things and decided to use that as like a thing. And I also made like a, a little like wooden, um, like a stick with some like tool on it as this, as the wing of this thing. So I remember watching this ladybird do this and being like very confused whether the ladybird was stuck to the, it, to this um, w winged insect or if it was, um, 
or if it was just using it to like try and move or and like so I was kind of trying to repeat that and then um yeah I thought I was thinking that it looked like a clock as well which is why I put it on that um I actually spent ages trying to make a score of it from the video and I wrote down like all the different times it did for ages um but then I decided that that wasn't necessarily the best route to go but I kind of wanted to include that somehow yeah <laughs> so I kind of like um almost kind of just collected um movements that were similar and did move and also made them and then kind of thought about how those could interact and like and then also when I made the two when I made my own version and there was that version I was thinking about like them in conversation to each other um so yeah mm. that's really interesting because we we've had a, a dancer on um mm. a few artists ago and she talked about um her, her work she'd made within uh an outdoor space and I guess there's a bit of mimicry in it but she what am I trying to say? Like the outdoor space related to what she was doing and her mo the movement she was making. So I guess that kind of relates, yeah. that's kind of a, a similar thread in, in your work. Are, are these movement scores something that you tend to work with um, a lot or how, how did you end up starting to work with that? Um, so kind of like before all the lockdowns, I was kind of trying to create these kind of group performances and using a score to do that. Um, but then, like since then I've been crying, you actually doing videos kind of similar to this but to do with like one particular movement or gesture and um thinking about like almost this thing of editing from within and like um different camera angles from that movement and yeah I suppose like so like one of them was like hoiking yourself up onto a horse and kind of how I could just replicate that quite easily like in my house or like or going down the stairs and then how I could like put words to that um so it's kind of it kind of became quite like makeshift and then um yeah trying to yeah I don't know if I'm explaining myself very well but yeah, yeah um I guess we often think about scores of musical pieces and how notes relate to sounds but um there's not off, there's not usually a lot of talk about movement scores which I think is a really fascinating idea yeah, I think um, a lot of it ended up becoming like how I would be responding to the space um, that I was in and also kind of like thinking about my environment as like a collaborator because I didn't have anyone to collaborate with. So um, and like how I could use the move like so, for example, I did a video in like my staircase in my house here and um, I was thinking about um, using the steps as a way of like um scoring how I spoke or like so every step I said one syllable um and then I went back up and said it again and like just that simple action of like this the way the environment is like determines how I will move and how I will um yeah mm. speak or mm. how the words will come out <laughs> mm. and that's very potent for us being in the same space for almost a year and how yeah how we've changed the way that we do things yeah and so how did you find the whole process of, um, I've asked this, uh, we've asked this to uh, most artists, the whole process of getting an audio and then making a visual from that? Um, I think, I found, I found it quite interesting actually thinking, using the audio more as like a thing, uh, um, a way to trigger ideas than to trigger the visuals. Um, and then kind of using, like, I feel like I have a bank of collected things that I want to do make work with and then kind of like refer using that as a source as well as um the the video you know, and um then kind of like weaving them together to make something um and yeah I think that's how I found it. it it was I found it actually quite hard to begin with because the audio was quite abstract um so I couldn't like make from it very like directly um so I had to like give it quite a lot of thought but I think that was a good challenge. Mm, it's been interesting because some of the audios have been describing the work and some have been more mm. conceptual. Mm. Yeah. Um, but yeah no I think it was good because um it kind of got me thinking about all these things that I'd already been thinking about and then how I could like actually create something in response to that. Mm -hmm. And then my final question before we um allow other people to, to have a wee 
uh, chat, um, is how have you found um, lockdown generally being an artist and, and not then being able to go see um, works or experience art physically? Um, um, I suppose it's kind of weird because I was getting into making more performance stuff and then suddenly there was no audience. Um, and, but I think, yeah. And then it was nice when I did start to do kind of more Zoom performances or like, I, I suppose I ended up making videos kind of to create something and then use that as like, create like a almost like formative vocabulary. I could then like use again or like build up um, like different, like small snippets of things. Kind of, I suppose, affect the scale of what I was making quite a lot. Um, but yeah, it's been nice recently when like seeing the degree show and actually going around galleries again, mm -hmm. um, it really does impact. Like seeing other people's work, just you kind of don't realize how much you need to see work in a space and mm -hmm. stuff like that. But yeah, mm -hmm. no, it's been a bit weird, but I'm looking forward to it opening up again. But I think it has pushed me in directions that I wouldn't have gone in, um, yeah. Great. Well, I'll remove our spotlights um, and then we can, oh, why did I do my second? Um, if you want to see everybody again, if you just go to view in the top right and click on the gallery view, um, then you can see everybody. Um, but we'll open the floor up for um, anybody who wants to ask a question or make a comment. Um, if you just turn your mic off and, and go for that. I need a bit of time to think. <laughs> Louise, you're on mute. <laughs> My computer's got very slow response, sorry. You were very lucky to find that video of the, of the at the right time to be there. Yeah. I actually I remember I was trying I was quite close to my dissertation deadline and I was it was this lady bird was like spinning in front of me um and I said I like was watching it for a very long time um and trying to work out how like I think it was quite mesmerizing how it was rocking and um because I kind of I, I was just going to see if it could turn itself over and how it was using this other insect to like maneuver itself around um as like it's as an extra limb. I don't know, it kind of reminded me of like a, like a capsized boat when they used like a, like the, the like, I don't know what it's called, the like thing. At the, so say there's a boat and then there's this and then they push down on that to like turn it back over. It felt like it was trying to do that, but um, yeah. And then I was like, maybe actually it's trying to let go of this, but it can't let go of it, but I don't know. Was the other insect okay once it, once the ladybird got unattached? I think the other insect might have already been dead. Right. I'm not sure though. We um, had a massive bee stuck in the Velcro bit of our uh, door going out to the garden, the you know, sliding doors. And we were trying to work out why it was there and it, it looked like it was dead. And then I realized it got its feet stuck in the Velcro -y bit oh that no. the draft and everything. Thankfully it went off. Hope it didn't sting oh. anyone though. <laughs> I think the other insect was a lace wing, but I could be wrong. I didn't. I was also, it, I'm not sure sometimes on the chat, so if people join late, they might not have seen the video as well, but I'm, yes. I could put it again. There you go. For those who've joined you, yeah. you look. Um, I did feel a bit bad for the ladybird, but it did manage to get itself up in the end. So. Anyone else got any questions or thoughts? Kim? How, how long did you actually watch the ladybird doing this for? How long did it take to free itself? Um, I'm, not actually, I'm not entirely sure because some of it I was time lapsing as well because it was okay. there for quite a while and then I also started filming a bit late and then I started filming and it was doing nothing. Um, but like at least te 10 minutes, maybe five yeah. minutes. Um, 
yeah it must have been quite tiring for us did you slow it down because I, I, I want to watch it again but what how did it actually get free right at the end did you slow it down and watch what actually happened right at the end when it ran off yeah so at the end I think it like managed it like um it looked really simple at the end which was kind of weird because it had been stuck there for so long mm. I think it let go of the the other insect and then just like did it did something I I was quite closely documenting the different um ways it was moving so I was going to try and do more specific movements in the shell um and like thinking about when so it there were quite a few different motions at one point it was like using this other insect to like push off the, the ground or whatever and then kind of like move itself and then sometimes it was really like holding on to the other insect like um kind of crawling back down it and then sometimes it was really leaning on its head and its side um yeah and then it just I suppose I'm quite interested in that movement that kind of and like where the weight of the insect was um and it trying to like really push itself up from that um yeah I don't I think, think I'd I, want to be stranded like that <laughs> I don't know if you're talking I'm thinking of all sorts of parallels with lockdown yeah I think also like the thing of being like upended mm -hmm. as like a um prompt I think and having like that exposed belly as well of the like insect and like um yeah and yeah leaning forward and backwards so it can get itself right, like the right way around again yeah, yeah it, was, it was quite interesting all the way through I'm thinking I'm pretty sure that's a ladybird but I don't know right at the very end you know yes it definitely is a ladybird but that, that's quite interesting isn't it that very often when we're when we're vulnerable when we're struggling we don't really know who we are and other people don't know who we are until we get ourselves right again and then and then it's a bit clearer but but that that vulnerable part of us is still us and it's it's, it's mm. not a bad thing to let people see it mm. yeah that's really interesting i didn't i suppose because i was there were loads of ladybirds in my room at that point so i was quite you, you, like i suppose it's not i i could I can obviously tell what it is yeah. um, but like actually that it takes a while to identify it is quite interesting as well to think about mm. and that like thing of its identity and a thing sorry you go you carry, on, carry on a thing that I was thinking about as well was this there's this quote from this book about play which was um, in the insect's case the mask or guise becomes part of the body instead of a contrived accessory and this kind of thing of like a mask or being like a contrived accessory but like if an insect is camouflaged it's already doing that but it's 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 part of its body and kind of just thinking about what is part of your body and what's not um and like what is part of your identity and what's not and um which bits you i suppose that thing of what's like automatic and what's not when we're like automatically responding to something and, and not Mm. yeah and our, our masks that we wear us or not you know yeah our, our, sometimes we wear masks so much that we don't actually know we're wearing them mm. yeah mm. i did enjoy seeing you in the the playground thing because i know <laughs> i know exactly where that is and i've seen a few adults playing in that as well so it, uh, <laughs> it brought back some happy memories <laughs> I was a bit worried actually about, um, I, I don't know, I feel bad using it when there are kids who, who might want to use it. So I made sure I went when it was rainy because then um, no, no one would want to be there. I don't think I've ever seen a child in that actually. <laughs> yeah, I, I, they're kind of weird. Um, I actually find playground equipment quite like intriguing as like how they came up with the different designs mm -hmm. for them because I think they're, I don't know, I, I'm quite interested in like, I think it's called like century where you're just like spinning mm. um i found this clip a while ago of um this man on sitting on a um on a office chair that can wheel it with like a leaf blower and spinning round and round and round really fast and I, I i think actually quite a lot of my videos have spinning in them um which is like another um like play thing that i was thinking about of like disorientation i suppose and um moving I don't know. I don't know why I'm attracted to not like or like why I end up using that, but um, I find it quite mesmerizing. Mm. I think the uh, roundabout in a playground was always my favorite, but it always scared me because you can go so fast and 
yeah they are scary and like you could like do you mean the ones that you can kind of walk on and yes yeah well you've always got people there who might run around it with you on and put you out of control and that and then and then there's a thing where adults as you get older you get less and less able to cope with movements like that mm. yeah. I have found that uh, I get more I don't know if it's called vertigo I know height is but when you're going round yeah. I don't know what it's called but it's well known that adults you know there's an optimum time in childhood isn't there where spinning is really good I remember that when my kids were little and I just couldn't cope with any of it but I, I do often think that they should make playgrounds for adults because I think adults would benefit a lot from doing these sorts of exercises but they feel so self-conscious about it and I think adults tend to go on it when children aren't around late at night and things like that mm. yeah I think that like physical play of like moving um and kind of using like these different equipments to kind of or like say even like skipping or like um like a hula hoop or something like it's not normal to use that as an adult but actually the physical engagement of it is quite um it's quite a relief from like i don't know what it, like working on the computer or whatever it is mm. um there was um an exhibition at the baltic a couple of years ago that was all to do with play and they had a room with lots of different shaped blocks um and on opening that i went and took some friends who are not into art really but they absolutely loved playing in that space and the whole point of the room was unless something was super unsafe the um the people looking after the room couldn't stop people from touching the work or do it, making whatever they were making <laughs> and there was a group of guys there who had built something right up to the ceiling like it was a tall room and they were running up and then sliding back down and you could see the attendants like oh, do we do anything i don't know the whole point of this is that it's freedom of play and <laughs> but um i really i liked that idea of bringing out that that idea of childhood play but with adults um, and what that freedom creates. There was a huge slide in the Tate a few years ago when we were well it must be about 20 years ago maybe because we it was when I think it was when we were still living in London but massive slide you know the idea was that adults could go down it and um, if you stood on a higher level you could see people going down it because it was several floors down. I, I didn't go on it. <laughs> I couldn't cope with things like that as a child <laughs> but that was all about play I can't remember who the artist was for it though I think there's quite a bit of research about um, how sitting on the swing and swinging can really help people with stress and anxiety and and trauma um, I was re I don't know how I got onto this but I was I was reading a book that, that was uh, talking about that and then I went online and there's just quite a lot of stuff where where swings really do help people you know um, I know it, it used to help my children when they were young if they were sort of tight and they would I know when I when I was a kid even when I couldn't even I wasn't able to sit on the swing I can remember my dad took cine films of me uh, with my tummy on the on the swing and just you know just leaning over it and just swinging backwards and forwards I know I used to do that for hours as a child um, I think so there's something about that back and forth motion yeah. and also like something kind of just like your body like the excitement of it moving and just yes. like being quite inside yeah. that that yeah. moment I'm, I'm sure there's sort of all sorts of you know deep-seated stuff about being rocked by your parents and things like that mm. but 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 also yes I think that that excitement and sudden change of of, of direction and the sort of the feeling that it gives you uh, when you especially mm. when you when you swing high and yeah a, a competitive element if you're swinging alongside someone else um, yeah before you said all that I was thinking I wonder if it relates back to the feeling you have when you're in your mother's womb of sort of swelkering from side to side yeah like a rocking yeah mm -hmm. I, actually there was a podcast that I was going to listen to that they did like at the star and shadows um there was like a radio show actually about rocking and they had like some music about rocking as well and they were like talking about it but I actually haven't listened to it all <laughs> so maybe lesson I think it's on the archive or something um, okay. I wanted to ask but in your oh sorry no you go ahead um I was gonna say in your audio there's almost a sort of swinging or like there's playful um 
as you listen to it as well like you've got those two elements of play which I think is really interesting yeah thanks I've been thinking yeah I was thinking about different ways I could use like different syllables to like go from side to side um and I'm just quite into the word upended at the moment um and I, I kind of go around and getting into different words but um and then kind of like lots of prepositions and um how they can play off each other and mean lots of things like up front and then back and then side and um kind of using that as like to respond to what's happening in the movement in the video Sarah has just asked um where the text is uh, from in the audio of the piece where is the text from in the audio of the piece um, it's, it's not from anywhere in particular, it was um, from my head, <laughs> um, but like um, thinking about these, almost the, the ladybird moving and myself moving as these two different characters kind of almost having an argument about what the time is um, mm -hmm. and yeah, I don't know how I got there with that, but I was kind of thinking about, they were kind of not agreeing about um, because the first bit shows the ladybird moving like a clock and then working out um and then the kind of absurdity of like the time moving that fast and so randomly with this rocking and um one of the like moving ones doesn't want that <laughs> yeah I don't know this it's not very, very sorry sorry is it very is it very for your voice but like yeah it is yeah I think because I'm I've been like reading like old like Aquinas or like old church fathers and stuff recently and often they have like a dialogue with themselves and it seems quite absurd when you like read it back because it often is like do you think that this like I don't know they like kind of propose a question and then sort of answer it but they're kind of talking to themselves it's this like back and forth dialogue that um can seem quite absurd sometimes but um yeah it's just made me think of that as you well, that's interesting yeah I think um I don't know, in the past I've been quite interested in like a uh, call and response kind of relationship between different like people who are performing and um, but then I suppose like recently I've been doing quite a lot of videos where I'm talking to myself but like, with different characters and um, I don't know if it works as well as I'd like it or like I'm not sure if I'm if I'd rather have other people involved or not um, but I suppose I'm just trying it out for now um, but yeah and also kind of like song they've turned videos of making have turned into song um kind of when like of how like you could be singing to yourself and then um almost talking to yourself in that not um but yeah i think um like gregory of nessa i don't know if it's like a niche very niche like reference but like he has that isn't like i had an audio recording a, a book that's kind of like a imagine conversation with his sister who was like a nun i think but yeah, it's kind of like a dialogue, but it, he's imagining what she was saying to him, but it's based on like a conversation like just before she died or something. Um, but yeah, but then that other people in that kind of time period seem to like, dialogue seems to be like a quite prominent way of working through thoughts, I think. Um, what was the name of that person, sorry? I'll write it in the chat. Uh, yeah. Cool. Um, yeah, that's interesting I think yeah I think I suppose it's an, it's another part of play it's kind of like imagined conversations I actually used to well um, when I was like quite young I used to play a lot of games where I was talking to myself or well, not talking to myself where I would like say something and then turn around and then be like no and then kind of um play all the different characters so I suppose that's just coming out of my art but um yeah I, I don't know it, yeah, kind of working out how that could, could be interesting to someone else as well, because <laughs> it, it can get quite internal. Um, yeah, I don't know, I feel like it. I, I find it more easy to work when there's like something I'm working against or like um, something that's out of my control as well, because otherwise I can get a bit, um, yeah, mm. uh, dark or impenetrable or something. Um, but um, yeah, so that's kind of why I like collaborating with like people or things or like an environment or like a uh or like a bit of footage that I already have but yeah 
some like some kind of stimulus. Mm. Yeah, I think that kind of goes back to the score thing we were talking about of having like a score as like a stimulus and then responding to that and then using that response as like another score or like another stimulus and then um, yeah that's kind of why I was, was wanting to do this project because it's kind of that whole thing of like these different things triggering different things. Um, Is you because you said earlier you have an archive of thing of things you want to making something or video or have you got physical archives as well um i i suppose it, i mean i yeah i suppose they're kind of more chaotic than an archive like they're very much like um kind of sitting in my head or like s somewhere and um amongst other things but um yeah i suppose actually it's kind of there's a few phrases as well um, like actually rather than objects so like um, which I kind of like find I can I kind of refer to them as like sticky phrases or like bits of sentences that I would want to use in something else or like that I have used already and I do but I still think about so like one of them was like thicket of thought and I stole that from like a, a visiting artist but like they said it in like a sentence so it was free um, and then kind of uh, like wide angle smirk as well and then um so i kind of i've got quite a lot of those kind of things um i've got yeah i do have quite a lot of footage i have i have got quite a lot of object like materials that i've kind of like i was quite into hair colors at one point um and velcro um actually um and specific i get really excited about and then buy a lot like have like try and get a lot of them usually they're quite cheap and then kind of get back into that repetition thing of having like a lot of one thing and what kind of them of these um yeah um i sorry i came late but i managed to just watch the video um and i was thinking about like the way that your voice kind of move like the tone of your voice moves and kind of contorts and changes and I know that you do that in other videos and I was wondering if there's like I don't know if there's like a reference that you're coming from with the way that your voice changes and I don't know it's it's cool I feel like it's actually it's quite um it's, be it's definitely like trial and error like I would, I've got so many recordings of my phone and then I, I kind of have to just like pick the ones that actually work a bit and um I think I don't know I think I quite I'm quite into like an incredulous voice or like one a kind of a voice of disbelief and kind of um yeah I don't know I feel I don't really have any references for them they're just like um made up really <laughs> but um yeah I yeah I suppose like they become like characters a bit maybe um <laughs> has anyone got any other final thoughts or, or comments or questions before we listen to the audio all right and um, so this is the audio that lucy received from taya um so you'll hear the, I didn't know what the word meant either, Lucy, um, but you looked up the meant repetition. I decided that the, the one thing that I didn't know what I, it meant, I would latch on. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I'll play this and um, just give me a thumbs up if you can hear it. Hi Lucy, well this is like my third time trying to record this but that's fine, um, I'm much more articulate when I'm candid but anyway, um, so for the last, the last artist kind of gave me general concepts and ideas um, that they've been thinking about and that they would like translated um, instead of a description but I'm just going to free ball it, I'm just going to do things my way um, and I'm really, really keen to see how you're going to interpret them. Um, I've been thinking a lot about materiality, um, tenderness and what that means. 
Um, my work is kind of like a meditation on on abundance and this childlike sense of play and um, wonder and unknowability and mystery but at the same time this darkness this kind of this passage of time which is really like pertinent in in my work in general and what I'm what I've been making and um and this kind of encroaching kind of these encroaching figures or this encroaching well the figures of certain concepts not, not like embodied figures as such um but about the way the body embodies space and how certain phenomenologies are different um i've been thinking about delicacy immediacy um echolalia and yeah i'm running out of time <laughs> Epilalia, that's what the word was. Great. Um, so before we finish, does anyone have any final thoughts or comments after hearing the audio um, about how that related to Lucy's work? Yes, what would you be putting in your audio for the next person if somebody else was doing it after you? I actually did do an audio, um, so we could play that, I don't know. Um, but yeah, I was kind of talking about repetition and things we've talked about um, in this talk. Um, but yeah, Lucy's audio will be um, at the post view. You'll hear okay. it yeah, in, the, in the process. Mm -hmm. it, it won't be given to anybody, but it uh, it is made. <laughs> Anyone else? Great. Well, thank you so much, Lucy, um, for being here today and talking um, to us about your work and the process and how you found it. Um, that's been really great. So our, our last event for Unseen is a post view, um, and that's on the 9th of July from um, 7 to 9 p.m., um, maybe a bit shorter. All of the artists um, will be at that. We'll be listening to the entire audio score. Um, so it's good we talked about movement scores today, um, of all of the audios and also seeing the works um, in order of how they were made, um, which would be quite interesting to see how the process has happened as a whole, because these lunch times have been great um, to di dig a bit deeper and see individual works, but seeing them as a whole is um, also a really, that's why we did it as a project. Um, and that is a different Zoom code from these lunch times, but that's all on the website on our Unseen page. So thank you so much for coming and I hope to see you at the post view. Um, and that will be Gemma, my colleague, who's leading that. Yeah. Thank you very much. It's really fun. Bye, Lucy.